My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the CEO of After the Fire. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, Recover, Rebuild, and Reimagine. In this podcast, we bring you the very best practices, best hearts, and great ideas from other disaster-affected communities. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster. In this podcast, we try to help communities learn how to recover, rebuild, and reimagine. My favorite part of this podcast is amplifying um, re the really cool, smart, talented, innovative people that I have met in this space. Sometimes they're local, sometimes they're public officials, uh, sometimes they're in the private sector, sometimes they're emergent leaders. Today, I'm really happy to have with us uh, Dr. Krista Lopez. And I met her about two and a half years ago at a conference in Washington, DC, hosted by Fannie Mae and the Institute for Sustainable Development. We uh, got along right away, and um, she is one of the truly um, impressive, um, just as a bonus, female leaders in this space. Uh, we have stayed uh, connected and been at a few conferences now together, including one in her own home state of Texas. Currently, Dr. Lopez works for the Texas General Land, the GLO. What is the O? You're going to have to tell us what the O stands Office. for. Office, so obvious, right? The Texas General Land <laughs> Office, which for some reason has a plethora of really cool, powerful, um, smart women in this area in the field of disaster. So I asked um, Krista to come on today to talk about her own um, background because I'm really fascinated by the fact that she really started in this work by assisting her husband in their crime scene cleanup business. So that's very interesting. Um, but I also wanted her to talk about her, her um, PhD, her thesis in um, how to be uh, culturally uh, competent and effective in a disaster where that's helpful. So her research in that area is of great interest to me and I think it will be to you as well. Um, and I just wanted to, to get to know uh, Dr. Lopez on a, on a wider level and, and hear about all of her experience and her take on disaster and what's needed and where we're headed, especially in this age of um, really an ex people who are finally accepting climate change um, in, in the face of huge climate disasters. So welcome to the podcast, Dr. Lopez. Thank you, Jennifer. I am so glad to be here and to join you all. And I did have a very um, different path uh, to all of this, but uh, I think everyone who works in disasters and emergency management doesn't usually come into it off the ground or out of a college degree and is like, this is what I want to do, right? Um, so I'll back up. Um, I started my life career in horticulture. Um, I was a plant science major in college. Uh, I studied biotechnology and um, really was involved in campus life and realized wow, I could work on a college campus. Uh, and that really fascinated me. And so I shifted careers and went straight from undergrad to graduate school. And I ended up getting a master's degree in counseling. And I spent um, close to, I would say at least 19 years in higher education. But each year in higher education, I kept getting assigned to these crisis roles. Um, I kept getting drawn into the campus emergencies. Um, I helped to develop policies around um, emergency management actually and evacuation policies for the residence halls on campus at one university I worked at. And in the background, I was volunteering. I was volunteering as a firefighter, as an EMT, and then search and rescue for 15 years. Um, I had a human remains detection dog. My very first search that I ever went on was um, the Space Shuttle Columbia crash in East Texas. Um, my first volunteer slash assignment after I got my EMT license with the fire department was to go to New Orleans um, the day after the levees broke during Katrina. Um, so I've had some unique opportunities um, and really great lessons. Um, a little bit of drinking by the fire hose, as we call it, um, because they were on the ground in real time life lessons about real time disasters. And I kept touching those things in my volunteer world and really, really felt the calling to make a profession. So I sought a second master's degree in emergency management and a number of other trainings and then moved in 2015 to Texas Division of Emergency Management um, and was quickly promoted into a role 
overseeing the individual assistance program. That's the program when folks think about FEMA funded programs, that's the one that helps individual households, right? So, you know, that is perfect for my background in counseling because I understood what the human need was. Um, I understood the complexity and diversity of individuals and people um, and also could apply that to the disaster world. So from that uh, experience, 2017 occurred here in Texas and so did Hurricane Harvey. Um, my knowledge in the individual assistance program, uh, which includes housing, and then also having worked in higher ed housing for almost 13 years, um, it was a perfect pairing and FEMA approached the state of Texas, asking the state to run the first ever FEMA funded state led direct housing mission. That's, you think of FEMA trailers and, and temporary housing and so forth. Um, that's what we were asked to run. And so because the general land office is going to take on this mission, um, they were also informed they could borrow or take any staff from other state agencies to help implement this program. So I shifted from Texas Division of Emergency Management to the general land office, and, and here I am. So that program went on for three years. Um, I now oversee all of the grant operation programs for the general land office. Uh, and also serve as the chief of staff for our team. We have a staff, uh, full-time employees, um, about 200, um, plus about another 300 vendors. Um, so we have a large team and our overall mission right now is implementing as well as administering all the community development block grant funds for disaster recovery that HUD funds to the state of Texas. So we work a lot with individual households as well as our individual communities. So for people that's who it. You, people, for, and for people, you may just, you can just be like, oh, that's all. But for people that's who all. don't actually <laughs> understand the complexities of individual assistance or block grants, um, navigating each of those is difficult. <sighs> navigating both together is monumental. And the amount of uh, attention to detail, understanding of the landscape, understanding of the the field of disaster from, you know, really the um, people who are boots on the ground are most, most severely affected. The individual to the institution is no small feat. So you, you can go on it's about that. It, it's, it's oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is a lot. And, you know, as a disaster survivor, and as you mentioned, I um, completed my PhD work and I looked at disaster survivors' experiences with disaster volunteers um, and, and from a, a, a lens of, cultural competency, you know, because volunteers come into communities, there are different cultures than their own. Um, there are different people, there's different ways um, that folks go about doing life. And so um, that being said, these are also folks who have experienced the complexities of disaster in itself, right? So there's so many layers to unpack when it comes to a disaster. There's that immediate um, experience, um, identifying those quick basic needs of food, shelter, you know, do I have connection to my family? Am I healthy? Those sort of things. And then it's, okay, so where are we going to live while we rebuild um, often, you know, if the home was destroyed or, or majorly damaged? Navigating those federal programs is absolutely a monumental tax, task. You said it on par because even those of us who have been in this field for a while, um, the rules change on us, right? It's not even the same from disaster to disaster. Um, and so um, we get why folks are confused by it because we too have to remind ourselves, oh, I'm working with somebody from this disaster. So it's these rules, right? Um, there is well, some- and the, and the number one rule is always to meet people where they're at, use the tools that yeah. you have to adapt into that space. But it's, right. I think unless you have a learning mind, this is impossible work. Unless you're like open to never, ever, ever, ever knowing at all. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I like to say that insurance is absolutely the first step in the process. Um, I also get that sometimes you're having to make a decision between insurance and paying your electric bill or buying groceries. So I know that that's a challenge for a lot of folks out there but insurance truly is the first step. Um, that is the step that will probably make any household as close to being complete and whole as anything else. The FEMA programs, they say up front, although it's not remembered often, but they say up front, their intention is not to make people whole. It's to help 
kind of fill a, a small gap. Um, and then also, those. Sorry, but people don't, sure. until you've undergone a disaster, um, you know, there's this, we are natural, we are human. And so there's a certain amount of magical thinking that's involved, which is, um, and, and I'm not talking about what happens with poverty or having to make that decision between your insurance and um, get renter's insurance though, like that's five yes. to 10 bucks a month. So please do that. Um, but it's that, it's that idea that um, you don't, obviously, these are skills you don't need until you need them. And yeah, yeah. Um, that can make it very um, difficult to prepare for and then respond to. So I think there's an extra, there's almost like a shock wave, a second shock wave um, after a disaster and people realize that FEMA's job is not to save you. That's not what they do. Like they will, they might save you physically. They might like have some, some services. They do the very best that they can. They are way overstressed at this point. Um, last year, we had $20 billion over disasters and they counted all of our wildfires, which is the worst season on record, 10 million acres, $16.5 billion as one of those. So <sighs> FEMA is not going to, they're going to help you. They're not going to save you. And so I think people have to know that in advance. Most definitely, most definitely. Um, and it is complex, right? Because they tell you register at disasterassistance.gov. Um, then you have to figure out, is your county one of those counties that's eligible for the disaster, right? Not just did your state get a disaster declaration, but is your county. Um, I know there are, are cities here in Texas that span three counties. I've seen where two of the counties have been declared and the third hasn't. So if you live in the same city, you all may not be served, right? So that's how crazy this can get then once you register, they might refer you to SBA, which is a small business administration. Oh my gosh, a disaster loan. I'm already overwhelmed by this disaster itself. How could I imagine taking on a loan, right? Um, but it's well, understanding the benefits of that loan, right? So if you can get it though. Like I love SBA, it. but you know, in our case, about 80% of people were denied. And so right. it's a, and so I think SBA pulled off a miracle last year. So for all of our friends at SBA, I'm not knocking you so much as, you know, talking about how we can change the message. So it's more realistic at the outset. That's all. Absolutely. It is a loan and you have to qualify for it, right? You have to show that you have an income and that you're able to repay that loan um, at the terms that is agreed upon. Yeah. And so, especially last year, when so many individuals were unemployed, there was no way to prove that you'd be able to repay that loan, right? So that compounded those issues. Then a year or two later, these people like my staff from the general land office come along and go, hey, we've got money from HUD. How about if we rebuild you a house? Um, and then it's like, wait, but that disaster happened a couple of years ago. Why are you coming now, right? Because it literally takes an act of Congress to get a federal appropriation, which just means get money, <laughs> to bring money in for disaster recovery. And it sometimes takes two years to implement, if not longer. We just got um, money from 2017 that we had asked for and was, was appropriated in 2018, like last week. And it had to yeah. be, and it was, it's long. And you know, here's the thing, recovery is long and FEMA yeah. and our federal agencies, they're trying to prevent fraud. Um, so we totally understand that. We think there are some ideas, though, that we can move it a little faster, that they could do it in tranches and at the same time do fraud protection. And you're also often dealing with, uh, sometimes you're dealing with counties or states that are not super well resourced, don't have the staff, don't have the, the knowledge, they don't know how to navigate it. It's one of the reasons why we do advocacy in D.C., but uh, and we do it with the public sector so that we can support their efforts. But Everyone's a novice in disaster until you're not. And then, and, and so it's just important to know that the money is slow, the recovery is long, and it is possible. Absolutely, 100%. Um, it is definitely, as they say, a marathon and not a sprint. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You, so in Texas, you um, actually deal, you have a lot of rural counties. And mm -hmm. um, one of our big concerns has been um, as these uh, climate disasters are increasing for a variety of reasons in wildfire, it's actually just where the climate change is meeting a, a, a historical land um, mismanagement. And that's just, you know, it's all the things coming together at once. So um, rural counties are a very big concern of ours. Like we are concerned that um, 
counties, if they're not well resourced and they don't have the staff or experience, uh, it's very difficult to navigate. And you know, the the FEMA process, or even the, the state does a lot of the FEMA process, but it's just it's so. What, what do you run into in rural counties? It's different from say like um, where when Hurricane um, when Houston took place, or Hurricane Harvey. You know, Houston was actually super savvy in so many ways. And not that it was perfect, but there were a lot of corporations there. There was about $220 million worth of donations came in. But you know, how Houston's going to recover may, is not going to necessarily look the, look the same in another much more rural county that didn't get that sort of attention and doesn't have those resources. Can you talk about how you navigate that from a state perspective? Sure, so, um, you know, we have to give equal attention to all of our jurisdictions. Um, but we do know our rural jurisdictions do really have a huge challenge. They may have one building inspector. That one building inspector might be also on their public works team. Maybe they're also their emergency manager or their floodplain manager. So they're wearing multiple hats. Um, they're not getting paid the same as a building inspector in another city. So, um, and I bring that position up because when you think about a disaster, the first thing that has to be done is buildings have to be assessed for their stability, um, you know, and so who, who's that go to, but your building inspectors to your public work staff. Um, so are you, jurisdictions have to think about in rural areas and cities, are they involving those individuals in that disaster preparedness? Are they involving them in training? Are they involving them in um, their plans so that they can pay them emergency pay so that they can work all those extra hours that are gonna be placed on them, right? Then rural jurisdictions are now faced with what we call the, the social media news effect, right? The news media comes in and they highlight those cities, right? They highlight the big jurisdictions and that's where the donor dollars and the volunteers flood into. But sometimes those rural jurisdictions, not that they need it more, but it's just different. Sometimes and they, they do, and, and they might they might need it more because maybe there are more resources within a larger jurisdiction, right? So they're now at a further disadvantage because they're not getting the same attention through news media and social media that some of the larger jurisdictions are. Um, they may not have the resources to, or knowledge how to manage volunteers or donations. So when donations flood in. There's cash donations, there's in-kind services, and then there are goods that are donated. Those unsolicited goods can sometimes be a disaster into themselves. Um, you know, you, you hear, I've heard over the years, and I've witnessed, because I've done donations management for disasters, I've witnessed dirty mattresses being donated. I've witnessed cat costumes. And uh, one year we had um, someone donate pickled sharks. Like, I don't know oh why. In, yes. in VAKs, I, I interviewed um, Kelly Thompson and Mark Martin Brush from VAK Love, and somebody sent ice skates. And VAKs is off the, off the coast right. of Puerto Rico. Of Puerto Rico, yeah. They don't need anything in no. VAKs yeah. related to ice skates, yeah. Yeah, so, we tell um, people don't, unless it's asked for, please don't send it, no matter what. Like, your need to give has to be less than the need to receive, and it's very nice, yeah. and you can, there are things you can do to help, and one of them is don't create a secondary disaster. Like, in Paradise, um, I, I went, and I, I was in the Walmart parking lot that you all saw on the news, and I saw the biggest bin I've ever seen in my life, like a 40-foot shipping container, 20 feet high, overflowing with in with in-kind physical donations all headed for the landfill so that's another consideration it has to go beyond that Thank absolutely you. yeah and then there's cash donations and a jurisdiction a city or a county they can't collect that there's tax implications to that so then they have to find someone who has an established 501c3 or nonprofit to manage that and if they didn't think about that ahead of time, that takes time to implement. And you have to find someone you're willing to trust will do right with those funds, right? And yeah. account for them and be able to show, you know, what they're going towards. So then you have the resource donations. You have um, well-intentioned folks showing up on um, heavy equipment machinery who may or may not be licensed to demolish houses, but they might say they know how, right? 
And do they create a secondary disaster? I, in my dissertation, um, I recounted the story of individuals following Hurricane Harvey. Um, there were some folks operating heavy equipment machinery, driving up and down the street. A couple had some downed trees in their backyard and they said, oh, we can haul that out front for you. So they quick jump on their machinery and they start pulling the trees out front to the curb and they ran over the septic field in the backyard, not paying attention to what was in the backyard and then caused $9,000 of damage to the septic tank. Yeah. It's unintended consequences. Uh, that come from really great intentions. Um, so having a system in place for those rural jurisdictions to know how to manage all those things, because their first thought is to manage the disaster itself, but there's all these little things that come after it. Um, it takes time and resources being people as well as vehicles to drive FEMA around and show them all the damage in order to get the money to rebuild. So and you know, to be, it was interesting. For, it's so yeah. different, though. It's interesting is that in a wildfire, there's really nothing to see. We're like nothing to see right. here. <laughs> right. It's all right. A bomb went off. You yeah. don't even recognize it. There's nothing to gut. There's nothing to muck. There is yeah. no mold remediation. And that's another yeah. thing that both, you know, both wind and rain and wildfire have so many um, things that we can hold in common and share. Yeah. And, but also like this learning curve we're all on in the era of mega fires, which just didn't happen before with this frequency. So it's always so interesting yeah. for me to hear from a wind and rain, you know, based person, not that you've never right. had a wildfire in Texas, but yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah 2011, yeah. 2011 yeah. was a rough wildfire year for us, for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and so talk about volunteers. Know. I love that. that yeah. That, I love that. In your dissertation, um, Dr. Lopez, one of the things I was really interested in was the idea of cultural competency. So it's not just a matter of, you know, well, it, it, it's, let's assume everyone is well-intentioned. We can talk about fraud in a different part of this conversation, but right. cultural competency and like you in California, we have a significant population of the Latinx community. And um, making sure that you, the first rule, which I know we already talked about of, of disaster is serve the community that's in front of you, right? So talk about, I, I, I think it's such a powerful subject for your dissertation. Can you talk about your findings there and sure. um, your advice? Yeah, so I, I interviewed disaster survivors in Rockport, Texas. That was the, the area that first experienced the landfall of Hurricane Harvey. And I wanted to understand what their experiences were with volunteers and then dive deeper into, did the volunteers respect the culture of the community? Did the community even identify what their culture was before or after the disaster? Um, and then if they had that magic ball to train uh, and advise future disaster volunteers, what would those considerations be? Um, so it's interesting, and I'll go to the culture of the community first. Um, I heard very clearly in that community, there's a case of have and have nots. So it's a coastal community. It's a small coastal town. And along the coastline, like, like many coastlines, there's some very expensive homes and some pretty wealthy individuals. And as you move away from the coastline, you have uh, the working class um, of the community. You have individuals who have lived in that community for years. Um, you have folks that have worked on shrimping boats for generations, um, fishing boats for generations. And so they tended to be the have nots. Um, they had their own sense of community. They had their own sense of purpose, but it was almost as if there were different pockets within just a very small town of different cultures um, based on class, some based on race, uh, but mostly I saw a very large class division. Um, I had one couple I interviewed who recounted a story that they were in line to register with FEMA and to talk to SBA about assistance. And they talked about how they came from, they were a working class family. Um, and in line was a gentleman who was from a very wealthy portion of town. Um, and they said, I know had it not been for Harvey, this gentleman would have never talked to us. But we bridged a friendship with him because we had a common shared experience. And we still have that same shared experience, right? And so they still have a relationship with him now. And had it not been for that disaster, they may ha have never had that opportunity to meet. But then I heard from another individual who shared, you know, things were great. 
at the beginning of the disaster. You know, everyone was generous, people were kind. And as I spoke to him, he said, you know, I was in church one day and the preacher said, well, you know, things are getting back to normal. Everybody's crabby and cutting everybody off and they're, they're not being kind anymore. And it made me laugh because, you know, it's, it's, true. it's, <laughs> it, it's like uh, when groups form, you know, you go through those phases of storming and norming and so forth. And, you know, you go back to normal at some point, right? Or what somewhat normal is what that can be. I met with uh, three individuals who opened my eyes to a pocket in that community I hadn't even considered, right? We talk about um, religion, religious diversity. We talk about race diversity. We talk about social class. Those are the main ones that usually come up. I met with widows. These were, yeah, and I, I did exact that. These were individuals who, leading up to the storm somewhere within the previous five years, um, two had been widowed and one was of the same age group, but had been divorced. And so I kind of widow slash divorcee, but these are individuals who they made life decisions with their partner. And so imagine going through one of the most challenging life experiences without that person you used to depend on to make those decisions with. So now they're looking at their home that they've lived in for, you know, whatever, however many years. Um, and a group of people are standing on their lawn going, oh, we need to cut down that tree for you. We need to move this. We need to do this. How about if we do this for you? How about we do that? And whoa, whoa, I need some time to think about this. But didn't even know if they had the voice to say so, right? Didn't even feel like they had the control to say so. And so they really opened my eyes to those other parts of the community that we don't always consider when we think about the diversity of a community. Um, so my overall takeaway was we have to, each individual community really has to learn what are the pocket groups within your community? Because what I learned from one woman was almost that entire street were widows and they all had the same experience. Um, most of them had lost their husbands over the past three or four years. Um, they all kind of supported each other, but they felt overwhelmed by the volunteers because they felt like someone was trying to tell them what to do as if they had to have caretakers, right? That they couldn't make decisions on their own, that someone had to educate them about what they needed. I even had a couple um, who share the story about how some disaster volunteers were just very um, almost forceful, I guess, in how they they stated, well, we have to do this for your property. You need to have this done um, versus stepping back and asking people, what would you like us to help you with? Um, and, and several times I would end each conversation with, if, if you had to tell disaster volunteers, you know, one or two things, or if you had to train them, what would you like for them to know? And a resounding response was just listen. I just want somebody to sit down and hear my story. And again, sometimes we think physically doing something for someone is what's best for them, but sometimes they just want someone to hear their story. And that's all. Um, and that is as important as cutting down a tree or sifting through ashes to find the remaining belongings. It, they need somebody to talk to because this is emotionally exhausting. It's a mental health issue too. You yes. Know? And they don't want to feel like, we, we just took the lessons we learned during our disasters and applied them to the organization, which was, uh, we asked, what do you need? How can we help? And um, we don't do things to you. We do things for you, which means that we have to ask. Yeah. You know, if, and if you can't listen, then, you know, I was recently in another uh, uh, wildfire zone and I was talking to, I, we love an emergent leader who has that learning mind and a natural talent for it. But, you know, this person specifically told me that their desire was to design, help design a recovery that did not include wildfire survivors, that he didn't want to talk to them. And I was like, well, then I can't work with you at all. Like, can't do it. If you, like, this is exactly the wrong approach. Like, I'm not, that we do know. Like, that is a right. thing. So I so appreciate that. And also just like, 
how would you ever know that there were this 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 lane of widows who needed that listening and then the, and you know being told that they could they were empowered to make decisions yes. you know community led design and design recovery is actually key to yeah. successful recovery so i just like i got goosebumps over that thank you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it it's still to this day i mean there were certainly other takeaways and and overall they love the volunteers. They were fantastic. They they wish they could have stayed forever. They developed lifelong friends. I, one couple I spoke to um, had Mennonite disaster services rebuild their home for them. They're and so they've great. gone to the Mennonite community now up in Michigan and Ohio and visited them in their hometowns. They were like, now we have friends across the country. Now we have people we call our family now. So by no means do I want to dismiss what volunteers do. I spent my years doing volunteer work in disasters as well. So I know there's an absolute value for it, but I think if we can take anything away from it, it truly is sit back and listen, have a way to organize yourselves, train people, make sure there aren't those unintended consequences like running over a septic tank and causing more damage or having a tree fall on a house that was almost salvageable and now really is not. Um, those type of things, but really sit back and listen. People want to be heard. They do. And I think that, um, you know, it's always, uh, you know, beware, look for the helpers, beware of the heroes. Yes. Because, yes. You know, people, there is a, there's a certain adrenaline rush that comes from, you know, showing up and being of service and, and then, um, and, you know, it can be even, um, for some people, a bit of an addiction at a certain point. And, you know, you're like, your intentions are not wrong at all. However, you, you know, don't, yeah. don't be a hero, be a helper. When, when somebody says to us like, oh, so will you do that for us? And I'm always like, no, because I, I can help you. I can help you do it. That's my superpower right. is let right. me teach you how, what was done before you adapt it, make it better. You know, yeah. we'll support you, but this is, you can do this and we are not saviors and we are not heroes. And I think that's really Absolutely. critically important. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for how, um, what's your advice on um, how to assess where to send your cash donations? So um, that's a difficult one, right? Who do you trust? So I think understanding organizations that have been in the disaster world for a while um, that have a track record in history, if they're an operating 501c3, if they're an operating non-governmental organization, they should have records that are transparent about how they spend their funds. There are organizations out there that have done it for a long time and maybe aren't as transparent. So you have to think about um, who you want to share your money with. What type of mission do they provide? Because uh, there's a lot of voluntary organizations out there that um, have a specific role in mission. Some might be those, what we talked about earlier, the people doing the chainsaw work or the muck and gut work or, or taking away debris, right? But there might be some that do case management. They're out there providing individual one-to-one -one case work with the disaster survivors. Um, or maybe you're passionate about the folks that help the animals out, you know? There's, there's animal rescue groups out there doing some amazing work. Um, there are animal groups out there that are taking service animals to help support the disaster volunteers or first responders in their own emotional recovery, right? So, I mean, there's, there's layer after layer and, it, and it's almost like, Find what you're passionate about, and, and I bet you there's a, a group that could use your monetary donations. Um, I'm the type of person that when I give someone funds, I give them unrestricted too. So I'm not giving it to you um, with a caveat that has to be used in this realm or a caveat that has to only go to Hurricane Harvey. If you're a group that operates in disasters, I want you to be able to use it on any disaster because Harvey might be big right now, but maybe you have a lot of money in the Harvey bucket. And if it's just called Harvey, those organizations are only allowed to spend it on a Harvey. But if I tell you it's undetermined funds, then you can spend on anything that you want, um, any disaster. And, and so I also have an understanding that non-governmental organizations doesn't mean that they can't pay their staff. 
Oh, thank you. And they <laughs> do so much yeah. hard work. Mm -hmm. These are exhausted people. Um, they deserve a good salary. They don't deserve to get paid $27,000 a year to work 80 hours a week, helping other people recover from disasters when they themselves might also be a victim, right? Or survivor also, of disaster. Like talent costs money. Like that's yes. the thing is that you're in no yes. one's going to become, you know, if you're in the nonprofit sector, like you're not going to ever become a millionaire doing this. No. Like that's not no. going to happen. But you know, the idea that that in the nonprofit world that you should only you should pay people so low that they can become your own client, especially with social um, equity organizations. Right. Like I I I don't subscribe to that. And and you know, even at our organization, we make sure that we pay our we pay for our talent, but we expect them to use every bit of it like as if we were in the public or private sector. Most definitely. Most definitely. And I think when you pay individuals um, a honest salary, a solid, fair salary. They will feel appreciated and they will give you good work because you're showing them that you trust them and that you value them and they give you valuable work in response. And so I absolutely agree with that. I think you have to pay for good services. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to give them a really stressful job and then make them super stressed at home about whether or not they can feed their children like Ab that's anyway. absolutely but yeah when it comes to donations overall i think back to your original question find a group that aligns with your values what you love what you're passionate about um and consider truly giving them um unrestricted funds so that they are not hamstringed by how they have to spend those funds um, please take that into consideration for sure. Ah, I, I, I appreciate that so much. I just do. So can you talk to us about how you see um, the field of disaster sort of changing as more funds are put into the climate crisis? We're starting to see a lot of people who are popping up and we, we love an emergent leader and we believe that uh, we support, certainly support and foster their development and want to be there for them, especially when they arrive, when they arise from a local community. We don't really love if an emergent leader then tries and you know inflict themselves on a community they don't understand um but uh, you know i am very but i'm both happy for all of the attention coming in the funds and sort of this shift in the philanthropic focus in this area and i'm also a little nervous because um you know the first rule has to be do no harm you know do there's a lot of fraud in disaster and there's plenty of stuff for disaster victims to worry about you know, the first three types of people to show up are those who will defraud you, those who want to help you, and those who want to sell you something. So it's, you know, critically important. But can you talk about that, um, you know, what to, about the how you see the future of, of sort of climate crisis uh, or climate-related disasters or what you're seeing happening right now? Sure. I'm seeing things um, at the federal level because a lot of the funding I work with comes from the federal level. Um, I'm seeing a lot of focus on resilience and mitigation. So resilience is that word that people keep throwing out there. And I've actually been annoyed by it for a Me while <laughs> um, because I don't feel like anyone's defining it, right? But I appreciate the word too. So resilience is really how do you firm up? How do you steady in the wake of an event? Now, is that cyber attack? Is that um, a financial crisis? Is it a pandemic? Is it a natural disaster? How are you able to bounce back and in what time? And that's really what all resilience is. It's about being able to have the tools to not have the impact be so devastating that you cannot rebound or you can't rebound quickly. Um, so I do love resilience. Um, again, the term's being used a lot, but yeah. I do but here's, love it. Um, steal this though, yeah. Krista. I always say, how do you do equity? How do you do sustainability? Yes. And how do you do resiliency? Like, don't like, don't just give me those words. Like, show me Eat. how you do. It. So I may also become better in my own job in life. Like, sh we need to share the how of it, and you know exactly Abs what does that mean. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, when we think about, I'm going to nail it down to natural disasters because that's my, my specialty. But, you know, when we think about resilience towards natural disasters, 
are we giving people the tools to know ahead of time, if there's a disaster, these are the type of documents I might need to register with FEMA so that I can get on back on my feet. And we're, are we giving them tools how to find the right insurance company and to get those policies in place? Um, you know, one of the things we give out in our office that we've had made are just plastic dry bags and they have a checklist of important documents you might need in the wake of a disaster. Now that's not gonna help you on wildfire, I'm sorry. It, it does though, we're but, big on go bags. We have yeah. clothes because naked eva you know, evacuations happen all the time and they're only oh. funny like if, if it's not you, if, you know, but it's right. awful for those poor human beings. We don't have a lot of, um, we're lucky if you have uh, two hours notice, sometimes you have five minutes, mm -hmm. sometimes you have none, when you run for your life. It's right. a fire monster is real. Um, but so uh, that would work too. The plastic bag part wouldn't matter as much, but the list matters. See, that's yes. one of the things that we can share. Right, right. So, you know, having a list, knowing what to prepare. Um, Texas experienced a winter storm of unbelievable strength in February. And um, everyone that I know was without power and water for some period of time. I was without it for a week. Um, and my husband walked around the house going, I am so lucky to be married to a woman who has a PhD in emergency management. Um, and all those crazy little things I used to do aren't so crazy anymore. Like they make lids for Home, home Depot or Lowe's or whatever type of buckets that becomes a toilet. You might not think you need one, but let me tell you, it comes in handy. Okay. Um, okay. You put a trash bag. You put a trash bag in a bucket. And you stick that lid on because let me tell you, sitting on the bucket by itself hurts. Um, <laughs> oh, and also you you ask your 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 husband if he will take care of the disposal of it. Oh, of course, of course, yeah, yeah. Um, I even bought some of that absorbent stuff that they sell if you're like doing an oil change or something. You spill paint. I sprinkle some of that or cat litter in the bottom of the bag, so it absorbs some. So you're not reusing a bunch of bags, right? Okay, so, everyone at home though is now saying to themselves, I now know how to make an emergency toilet. So this yes. podcast alone was worth it. Yes. Um, I keep five cases of water in my garage stocked at all times because you will have water shut off at your house in a fire. You will have water shut off at your house if there is a accidental leak into the water supply system, if there is a shortage of water, if there's a winter storm, you name it, water will be not potable. And so you need to have a clean drinking supply of water. Um, if you have pets, your emergency kit has to include your pets. Um, and I know, I know there are folks who are like, I can't pack up my entire horse barn, all of our critters in five minutes when that wildfire or that monster is coming towards me. I get that, but thinking about ways to minimize the impact because it's devastating to watch someone who returns to their home and finds their pets have perished. It really oh. is. It is yeah. heart wrenching. Yeah, it um, happened to my cousin um, uh, Gary and his wife Jean in the Woolsey fire because um, you know they've been on that land for thirty years and had never seen. You know, they'd been through plenty of fires. Um, but had never had these kind of mega fire incidents. And so he didn't, he was there alone. He didn't worry about it too much. And then all of a sudden it roared past, like it's a football field every three seconds and they lost um, their, you know, dogs and they have mass, they had mastiffs like I do. And it, it still is probably the most hurtful thing outside of their house and more so even in many ways. And so you can though, like just briefly look up and say, who can help me in the event of a disaster? Absolutely. You know, like Absolutely. Show up with a horse, whatever it would take, to, you know. Take right. Things. Most definitely. I had um, a woman come speak to our team when I was working um, for Texas Division of Emergency Management, and she works for another state agency. Um, her, she experienced the Bastrop wildfires that we had in 2011. And um, she was in her swimming pool, um, hanging out in the backyard. Um, somebody comes knocking at the gate. Um, and she has a game cam on her front gate. So you can see the footage um, from the game cam of this individual, you know, getting their attention, honking the horn and everything. And so she and a friend that was with her 
um, piled everything into one car. They got all the dogs, they got the neighbor's dogs and they got out. And she said, you can watch on the tape and she played it for us. Yeah. You can watch on the tape as the straps burnt and the tape and the, the game camera shifted from her front gate to her house. And she has the footage of the darkness and then all of a sudden her house just erupting into a fireball and it was gone. And she said that fast, had that person not come to the gate, um, that fast those stuff those things happened. She said, but there were two of us. Why didn't we take two cars? We could have fit more dogs or stuff, or we could have, she's like, hindsight is, you know, 50, 50, but that whole perspective of think about what more she could have grabbed maybe if she had taken two vehicles. And so she kind of went through this whole thing. And my thought was, um, wow, what a lesson to learn about how quick from this footage that that happens, right? Now I have to say the curious mind in me also wanted to know who made the game camera. Because- oh my God. Me too, that's so funny, I like, was gonna ask you. <laughs> how does it survive yeah. that event that has melted everything else around? The camera, of course, was not in great shape, but the disc itself that recorded the video was. But that was a valuable piece as well because she literally pulled that video out and showed her insurance company and they were like, okay, done. Like, yes. there's no argument there. Um, and yeah. I'm not saying that folks have to go out and get a game camera, you know, for your yeah. property, but, but, but. But we tell them to videotape your home every year. Yes. Like it yes. takes 10 minutes. We, I just did, we just had our, had our first red flag uh, warning, which we've already had like a month ago, whatever, yep. fire season lasts forever now. Um, I was like, okay, so I'll take that 10 minutes. Um, so, so real quick on that. Um, Tornadoes are the same thing. Your house is gone when a tornado hits, right? And so I met with a couple who their house was completely gone and their insurance company was like, well, how do we know this is what you had in your house? And I met with them and I said, after the event, um, somebody in the family was standing around the grandkids and they were like, and we were just here last week and we were just having a big old family celebration, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wait, did anybody post pictures on Facebook? And they were like, yes. And I was like, pull those pictures up. You have photos of the house. You have photos of the contents. So it's not always lost. Think about what you did leading up to that. Social media can be really powerful in that sense because how many of us take selfies or you know do videos or whatever have you, and you might have that video, but you're absolutely right, Jennifer. Every time I go on vacation, I use that as my mark, or even if I travel for work, I use that as my reminder before I leave the house, I take a videotape of my house. A, if my house is robbed while I'm gone, um, I have proof, but then I'm always updating what's in my house and what my house looks like for insurance purposes. Most so, people have a smartphone, so you can do it. So, okay. So we talked about um, a number of things. I would like to ask you, like, cause we're always, we love the reimagined space. We love the idea that, uh, you know, we work in uh, to, we want to prevent, recover, rebuild, but also reimagine, which means innovation. What's your single greatest hope um, of what it, uh, of an area of innovation in disaster that you think would have a direct positive impact on communities um, that are disaster affected or disaster vulnerable? So I've spent a lot of time in the world of disaster housing. Um, and, and my wish is that we can identify ways to provide temporary housing that can then be turned into permanent housing. And, and we in our office are doing some studies and some research on that right now. And so we have some ideas of what, what that might be. And I truly do feel like it's achievable, um, but we need uh, the federal government and our partners who fund some of these efforts to also get on board, right? Because sometimes there's a challenge between one funding source and the other and, and duplication of benefits. And we certainly don't wanna um, go against any federal rules or to over uh, provide to one household that is at risk of under providing to someone else. But if we can, let's say, take a temporary housing unit and then in the long-term recovery efforts, add on to it and make it a more sustainable um, home and not just provide these structures that are flimsy, that can float away or fly away or burn to the ground quickly, but ones that are resilient, right? So every time we have to rebuild after a disaster, we should be thinking about resilience. We should be thinking about what materials, 
Um, what's the architecture of the home looking like? Um, there are limiting factors though, right? HOA have lots of rules around how things can and shouldn't be rebuilt and what the look of the, the neighborhood is. And so we probably need to start to get them involved and on board with things might not always look the same right? Because we're doing better with it. But if I had one wish and I could wave my wand, there would be better ways to make that transition from temporary housing into a permanent resilient structure actually work. Um, and I think the other piece of it, honestly, for me, for communities would be a better way to describe how to create mitigation strategies that work. Um, when I hear folks talk about mitigation when it comes to flooding, I hear about drainage. <laughs> there's more to mitigation than drainage. You know, there's, there's, there's environmental ways that we can use natural resources to um, create natural barriers. Um, I was in um, Indonesia several years back um, speaking about um, emergency management and we were replanting the mangroves around the islands to create that natural barrier, right? So there are ways that we can reduce impacts of storm or surge or so forth, um, or in wildfire circumstances, that urban wildfire interface um, that we can use other resources. So on the housing side, it's how do we make that transition happen? On the infrastructure side, it's, it's how do we make that feel achievable and not this lofty idea. Like we talked about resilience. It's not just this lofty concept, but it's something we can truly do and make happen and see a difference. Bravo to that. Cause you know, I actually love that about the conference that I attended um, a couple of 18 months ago um, in, that you all put on. And it was like innovation and resiliency in disaster. And you had yeah. even FEMA people there, you know, talking about how do we innovate in a way for our housing for exactly like you highlighted and amplified and showed us, you know, showed them off to everybody. It was the first conference though that I'd been to where, you know, that was featured as a desire of FEMA. And I think that there, there should be opportunities for innovation, um, you know, in partnerships with NGOs, you know, public, private, nonprofit sector. I'm always amazed by how much of the, uh, the technology and the ideas exist but you know, bringing those all together in one place and actually doing it in a pilot, you know, even I, we love the term pilot, like you want to pilot something, let's talk about that. Um, yeah. So that we can make mistakes and share our mistakes and make things scalable. And really that piece of housing um, post disaster and doing, doing it so much better, you know, one of the, because of cost, you know, most of the houses rebuilt in where I live in Sonoma County, we're about 75% rebuilt which is kind of a miracle, quite frankly, only three and a half years post-disaster, but it's a very well-resourced county with high land values. So that, that absolutely plays into it. Um, but that piece of how do you um, build back in a way where your house will survive another wildfire? You know, my, yeah. Mom, yeah, my, yeah, my, my mom just happened to build this house deep into the wooey about a decade ago. And she was like, oh, I think I'm just going to build it like, you know, with all the best practices for no reason, had never been through it. She just was like, that's what she was going to do. During the glass fire of 2020, uh, the, that fire actually came into the tub scar, but it burned down all of her neighbors' homes, um, everything around her and her house. You could walk in and flip the lights on. It was fine. Yep. So there are ways that you can do it. How do you make that even financially accessible, which means innovation, gotcha. scalability? Right. There's a um, documentary out, I'm pretty sure you probably heard, The Last House Standing, um, that came out recently. Was that about Panama Beach? So it was Panama guy? Beach, yep, Panama Mexico Beach, City? That guy Mexico built City. That house, like, for no reason. Yep. Correct. Yeah, Tim Carpenter took me to that house. He, yes. I said, I, I, cause when, he, yeah, we were, we were at that conference, yeah, and, yep. and, and I was like, well, I don't want to speak on anything I haven't seen. So you have to drive me around for six hours the day before. So he did at a high rate of speed, though. I kept telling him, I'm like, so I want to talk to that person. He goes, oh, I'll stop here. But the, I think he's a chiro, he's a doctor of some kind. And he mm -hmm. built a house like to a different standard. Absolutely. He to do um, it. Learning yeah. from others, you know, and, and maybe you can't do all those pieces, but where are some of the pieces you can do, right? And that's about resilience, right? Where are those added layers you can put in there that make it just a little bit um, less time to bounce back later. 
Yeah, bits and pieces, you know, whatever's yeah. going to work. So, uh, well, I could talk to you all day, but the, but the, I do want to, I do want to know one thing. Um, does your husband still have a crime scene cleanup business? Yes. So we started that in 2007. Um, he and I started it together. As I mentioned, I did search and rescue. I had a human remains detection dog for a little bit. Um, and really, um, it was kind of a merge of both of our minds and our passions. And mostly it's about helping families in some of their darkest times. Um, it, it, it is, um, it, it's horrible to say, but it's actually rewarding to be able to be of service to others in their most challenged times um, and being there for them when they feel like there's no one else who can do that type of work. Um, no one should be re-traumatized in, this, in the sense that they now have to clean up after a loved one. Um, that is just a horrible experience. Their, their last thought of that person should be a cherished thought, not whatever scene um, came after their passing. And so um, we've been doing that here in the Central Texas community since 2007 um, and really love the work that we get to do to help others. Um, we also work with individuals who um, are in a hoarding situation um, or um, have some challenges around cleaning their house. And maybe it's gotten to a, an extent where a typical cleaning service would not provide the services. And again, that's a really difficult position because someone feels very vulnerable when they're reaching out to us, um, oftentimes embarrassed um, about the circumstances that have led to their home being in that situation. But we're not here to judge. We're just here to help, right? We're just here to provide a service to help them live in a safe and healthy and happy home. Um, and so to see the, the look on their face when they're able to return to their home in a hoarding situation or an extreme a cleaning situation, just to be able to think, I can breathe. I can be in here without hazards. Um, that's that's really rewarding. So yeah, we love it. Um, we we're gr glad that we get to do that. Well, it strikes me, I and mean, I'm going to sort of end uh, where we began, which is, you know, it's not that I like what happened here or how I entered into this field, um, but I. Where I meet these people who hold humanity at the core of every single thing that they do. And, you know, yeah. they, they professionalize their services to humanity, but, you know, that's the deal is if humanity sits at the core of what you do, then it is rewarding. And, and um, I just, I feel so um, grateful to know you and to know that there are, you know, people like you in this field who are um, excelling and pushing it forward and always holding humanity at the core and never forgetting that that's ultimately what it's about. Thank you so much. I, you know, just to end, I, my purpose in life, and I've told people for decades, my purpose in life is to be of service to others. And that whether I get to do that in our business or whether I get to do that in the disaster world or working with other colleagues who we can share ideas and bounce ideas off of each other and learn from each other. Um, I think that's why I probably have so many degrees too, is I feel like I'm forever learning and I thrive to learn because I can only help people when I have, you know, the, the best knowledge possible, right. Um, where I can serve others. And, and it really just helps me fulfill my life's mission. So thank you. Well, Oh, gosh, thank you. This is a good place to end. And thank you again, Dr. Lopez, for being on the podcast, How to Disaster. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, How to Disaster. For more information, please visit our website at afterthefireusa.org. And if you liked this video, please hit subscribe.